So today is the 14th of February 2021, and um, that we come here to train ourselves and to gain an understanding into the nature of conventions. And we call metta and love, this love that we have for each other. It's really the fundamental kind of state of our minds is that we all wish to have happiness and none of us want to experience suffering. We don't wish to receive harm from any others. But at the same time, we have delusion controlling our minds. And this delusion, it's been there for a long time. We've been creating karma for a very long time now. There's always been the sense of me, a sense of other, an ego that's perpetually present. And everything that we do, it's for the sake of me and getting things. And this pushes us into causing each other harm. So if we have a love for ourselves, but that love is too great, um, then this can cause harm. And, uh, and especially if that love, it's not within the bounds of sila dhamma, it's not within the constraints of morality. So the Buddha taught that we need to bring uh, this love within these bounds of sila dhamma. And uh, both the love that we have for ourselves and the love that we have for others. So in the tenets of Buddhism, um, the matter that we have, the love that we have, it needs to be a moral kind of love, one that's founded in goodness. And uh, so we use this morality to abandon a sense of self. And through doing that, we can reach a metta, a loving kindness that's pure. And uh, if we're going to talk about a metta that's higher than that, um, than what comes from sila that arises from samadhi. But if we haven't yet reached that point in our practice, then we still need to train ourselves. We need to see the drawbacks in having a mind that is tied up with selfishness, with a mind that is always doing things for me. So in order to go against this, we must train ourselves in being generous and sacrificing. We can give both um, our time and also the wealth that we have and give this to other people. And this gives us merit in return. So this merit is a fullness of heart and inner joy. And uh, when we do it, then we understand that reality of merit, that it is this inner goodness, this inner grace of heart. And when we do this, then we gain happiness. Uh, because this upadana, this attachment, is usually there binding over our hearts. And when we get any wealth, we instantly cling on to that. And uh, perhaps we don't know how to give that away in the right manner. We don't know how to use our money well. And this just leads us uh, to destruction, uh, to bad things. So if we use our money and spend that on gambling, on alcohol, on drugs, for instance. Um, this takes us along the path to um, feeling ill at ease, feeling uh, aggravated discomfort. And perhaps people obtain their money too easily in a way that goes against right view. Um, they get their wealth through wrong view. Some people may be very famous, um, like athletes, uh, for example, may have a lot of skills, very highly developed skills, and gain great wealth. Uh, but if they don't know how to use that wealth in a way that is beneficial, uh, perhaps they don't have any religion that um, they believe in and uh, they abide by. Uh, then they'll use that wealth in a way that causes harm. 
But for those who have intelligence, they'll know how to use their money in a good way, in a way that gives benefit to themselves and also to others. They give it to people who are disabled, those who are poor, and uh, give it away to charity, to different forms of aid. And this gives great benefit. It can also help to build things in society uh, for the benefit of the entire society, so such as paths, so that people are able to travel with more convenience. And this is all merit. So the Buddha taught us to abandon uh, wrongdoing, what we can call a papo in Bali. And really this papo is a heat, an inner heat. And uh, it differs, uh, this papo, this uh, wrongdoing, uh, between children and adults. Um, that children have the wrongdoing of children, adults have the wrongdoing of adults. So just like if a student doesn't study and they just want to uh, play around with their friends, um, then this is a kind of wrongdoing of that student. And perhaps um, uh, with nowadays, with uh, COVID, and they have to stay at home and study from home, some may not like that. They want to go out and play with their friends, uh, but some may like just being at home and not having to go to school. So if they don't like it, then they get upset by that. And this is this papo, this wrongdoing coming up in their hearts. And so not studying and just going and playing around, this is also the wrongdoing of a child. But when they grow up, then they look back over these issues and they just look very small, they look like childish things. Because adults have the struggles of adults, and you'll have to really work against uh, many difficulties in their lives. And perhaps for many of us, we have been lost, we've taken the wrong way. But if we have wisdom and enough barami, then we'll be able to find our way back, find a way to the right path, to the way of goodness. We see that there's just no use in wasting our time on frivolous things. And so we come back to study the Dhamma. So this abandoning wrongdoing, um, it's our acts of body, speech, and mind. But it's not the case that just because we're intent on abandoning these things, we'll instantly be able to let them go. Just like an alcoholic who's really strongly addicted to their drink, um, they probably won't be able to just give that up in one go. But what they should do, if they can't, is to drink less frequently and a, less, a lesser amount. This wrongdoing, it arises through our actions, um, its way of body and speech, and this creates kamma. And then this kamma pushes us into creating those very same acts all over again. So we need to set our hearts on abandoning these things, on seeing the danger and the drawbacks in unskillful actions, and seeing the benefits in keeping virtue. And through doing this, we act in ways that are kind to ourselves and to others. So this is both the act of abandoning unskillfulness and giving rise to skillful qualities. So we all know already that to develop merit, uh, we develop generosity, we keep our precepts, we cultivate our minds. There are many different ways to develop merit. You can also help each other out, listen to the Dhamma, share the Dhamma, straighten out our views, rejoice in the good acts, the good deeds of others. And then when we get merit from uh, for ourselves, and then we have the kindness uh, to share that with other beings. So 
the high forms of merit uh, fall under this path of dana sila bhavana, of generosity, of virtue, and of mental cultivation. And also we can phrase that as sila, samadhi, and panya, as a virtue, as collectedness of mind and of, and of wisdom. So we train ourselves in this every day, train our minds like this, um, sitting meditation like all of us do every night. And this is a great form of merit. So we should all really try to carry on with this, you know, try to train our minds so that they can get into samadhi. Because in the beginning, all of us are in a chaotic, disturbed state. Perhaps we're not very interested in the Dharma and we don't have a refuge for our lives. So we need to find that refuge until we gain a good understanding of it, until we see that um, not keeping virtue really aggravates the heart, makes it very hot and bothered. So then we come to study uh, we come to maybe read the scriptures, perhaps the Satipatthana Sutta. And the way that this is written out is very straight and clear. Uh, but it's just that our minds are not straight or clear. They're all stirred up. And so we don't yet get a clear understanding of what it's about. But if we read through that and try to follow with it, follow its teachings, Really what it's just pointing to is having mindfulness, that we maintain our awareness of the body, of the breath, no matter what posture we're in, we're mindful of that. When we're speaking, when we're thinking, we have mindfulness there. And we do this every single day. We can also use the mantras of Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha along with that and keep these mantras as a uh, post for our hearts to um, to be tied to, because if we don't have any foundation, we don't have any post to tie our minds up to, then whenever they experience any sense impression, they'll just run after that. You can draw a comparison to a cow that's close to a rice paddy, and if we don't tie up that cow we don't use rope to tie it up to a post, then it's going to just be drawn to that field. Because there's no owner of that field there to protect it. And uh, rice is the food of a cow. So just naturally, that cow will go to eat all of the grains there. But if we tie it to a post, um, then when it tries to walk there, this rope will be tugging at it, stopping it from getting there. And the cow doesn't have the wisdom to untie it itself, it just tries to use brute strength. So if that post isn't uh, firmly stuck there, um, then uh, the cow will be able to pull it over and get into the rice paddy just the same. But if we drive that post firmly into the ground, and tie the cow to it, um, then it'll be held. It won't be able to get into the paddy. So what this means is to keep our minds and our recollection here within these four foundations of mindfulness, over the body, over the feelings, over the mind, over Dhamma. And these become the posts for our hearts. Uh, because... Or rather, if our minds lose uh, this recollection, if they get distracted, uh, then they'll get pulled into attachment uh, towards the sense impressions that they experience because our hearts get so easily deluded by these things. It's avijja that tricks us. And avijja is the cause for sankharas, for this proliferation to arise. And then comes vedana, and then craving, and then clinging, and then suffering arises. So it's this avijja, tanha, upadana, this ignorance, craving, and clinging that causes us to experience uh, the various forms of stress. So how do we abandon this? How do we abandon clinging? 
we see that this is what causes us um, suffering, that we suffer because of this attachment. And when we're able to abandon it, then the heart can become empty. So it's really something that we need to, to try to do. When the Pucha taught, he didn't do so with reference to the scriptures. Um, he taught mindfulness, but he didn't talk about the Satipatthana Sutta, or the four foundations of mindfulness. What he said was that when we go into our huts, then we bow, and before we leave our huts, we bow. When we're walking on arms round, we maintain composure. We try to be careful and restrained and have our mindfulness there. When we're eating, we're composed, we're mindful, we contemplate before we eat, before we put on our robes, uh, we contemplate what we're using our robes for, and then we put them on. And before we're going to use medicine, then we reflect upon the purpose of that medicine. And so this is all mindful, mindfulness, being mindful in our contemplations, in our reflections. And uh, we're also aware of this mind itself. And this is jitta nupasana satipatthana. So we know whether the mind is pleased or displeased. And we're always teaching it. Whatever feelings come up, we tell our minds that this is inconstant. There is no true self there. And right here, if our minds have peace to them, then we'll be able to teach them well and wisdom can arise. But if they lack calm, then this banya just can't come up. So having a foundation of inner calm is very important. And it's not the case that this happens just when we sit. No matter what posture in, whether we're standing, walking, sitting, lying down, we maintain our mindfulness there. We always try to train ourselves constantly to always be composed, uh, to be careful. So we have this sati, this mindfulness, or recollection, and then we have sampajanya, this all-around knowing. If we're drinking water, if we're thinking about something, um, then we try to keep our minds here in the present moment, perceiving, arising, and ceasing. And if we can do that, it shows that our mind is in the state of stillness. And so we have these meditation objects, and we should be working at them constantly. And all throughout the day, we try to bring our minds to a state of stillness, try to arise, see, or perceive arising and ceasing. We open the door to this knowledge, seeing that the body is not me, it's not mine. See the body as merely a body. There's no being, no self, no other there. And here our hearts can turn empty. Um, they can get into a deep state of peace and settled and uh, collectedness. And both the body and the mind feel very bright and buoyant. And it shows that samadhi has arisen. So it can be kanika samadhi, this minor form of collectedness, or upajara samadhi, neighborhood collectedness. Uh, but no matter what comes up, we just try to develop it. Uh, we try to cultivate it. And when our minds can get into a state of upajara samadhi, um, then they'll develop uh, into apana samadhi just naturally as we carry on with the practice. But in order for that to happen, uh, this upajara samadhi it needs to be the normal state of our mind. Just whatever we're doing throughout the day, the mind is in this state. And then when we go to sit in meditation, it drops to an even deeper level. We joy, this inner fullness of heart really uh, comes up very strong. And samadhi develops and develops until we reach a state of upeka, of equanimity. And this is something that we can reach. It's something that we can attain to. And uh, if we get... Uh, oh, sorry. In the beginning, however, we must understand that whatever state of samadhi we're able to reach, that's already very good. 
Now, kanaka samadhi is something that's really important. And when we develop this, then we will see into the Dhamma, if we carry on without stopping. It's just like drilling uh, for water. In some places, they drill down 50 meters, and they're able to meet with water. But in other places, they go down 100 meters, and they don't yet meet water. They have to carry on going 150 meters, and they still haven't found water. But if they just carry on going, carry on digging, eventually they will find groundwater. So it's just like our samadhi, that even though it may be not much right now, if we just carry on without stopping, then it will increase, it will develop. And in the end, uh, we'll be able to reach inner peace. And then when our minds are in that state, perhaps we listen to the Dhamma and be able to perceive all things as just being conventions, that really there's no color, there's no name to these things. They're all just elements that exist in their own nature. When we gain this understanding with clarity uh, that all things are empty, um, then we also see that the self just arises from our mind's proliferation. For when the mind is peaceful, we see that really all things are empty. There's no me, there's no other there. We perceive this emptiness within our own hearts, and we see the Dhamma in this way. So when we cultivate our minds, um, we also bring up metta, this loving kindness. Uh, But this metta needs to be within the bounds of sila. And when we keep sila, that shows that we have metta. So we carry on trying like this. And it's natural for a lot of people in the world that their love is tied up with their likes, with their preferences, with their wishes. But here we must be very cautious, because if we have metta that's bound up with attachment, and we don't get what we want, then that love can very quickly turn into anger. We have kindness or love for others, uh, but if they do something that we don't like, if we don't get our wishes, then instantly anger comes up. So we really need to be cautious around this. We need to see that this training of bringing our minds into a settled, firm state is something that's very important. So we should all try to do this, to train our minds, to bring skillfulness to completion. And when kusala comes up in a full state, then the mind will turn bright. And this is the path that leads us to seeing anicca, dukkha, anatta, and constancy, stress, and not self. That we establish our minds in the body, in feelings, in the mind, in the Dhamma. And this is the post that we tie our minds to. And we do need to have something there to tie our minds to. And this rope is mindfulness. And the cow we can refer to as the mind. Another way of talking about it is to watch over ourselves, to watch over our mind, to bring up this puru, this uh, inner knowing, the one who knows. And in this way, the cow isn't able to wander into the rice paddy and eat everything there, because there's this inner nature of knowing that's taking care of the heart. And with this, if our minds go and attach to anything, we can teach ourselves, don't attach to it, and here wisdom will come up, and the mind gains purity little by little. So this is the very kind of heart of the teachings of the Buddha. So may all of you, whether you are monastics or laity, be intent on training yourselves in this way.